Uh, so let's jump in here. Um, you know, we're talking about crimeware today, um, trending the crimeware ecosystem, analyzing, understanding it, a um, little bit of everything. Um, I do want to point out that you know this is just not my work alone. Um, I'm backstopped by a team of really good guys back home, actually all over the world. Uh, they're sort of everywhere, scattered, geographically remote. Uh, but Kent Backman, um, Ahmed uh, Sonbal, uh, Rajas Saab, some of these guys uh, have been writing some of the publications I'm going to be talking about and referencing. Um, and all the things are linked in the slides too, so go check them out. These guys uh, do really great work. Um, additionally, really well backstopped by the community, right? Uh, cybersecurity is a, is a tight-knit bunch of folks, uh, whether it's uh, guys you know, you're connecting with on Twitter um, or you know, Intel sharing groups like the R Exchange and others, um, just really supportive. Um, and I couldn't do any of this, and I don't think we collectively could do this uh, without the support of each other. It takes a village, right? All right, let's get into this. Wow, those words look really big from down here. Crimeware ecosystem, right? Um, and you, know, you can read these, this sentence or two, and I mean, really all this is to say is that you know, this is not, um, as you know, not my president said, um, a 400 pound, uh, 400 pound guy is on the basement couch of his mom's house, right? Uh, the crimeware actors today are 100% sophisticated. Um, uh, for the most part, you know, I mean, there is still the occasional, you know, skit or two that get rolled up by, you know, uh, Europol on a routine basis. But uh, for the most part, the campaigns that we're all seeing are sophisticated, uh, market force driven uh, actor groups um, that are really applying lessons learned and best practices from industry. Uh, so they're scooping up lessons learned from, uh, from Verizon, you know, um, how, how they set up customer service, right? And we'll talk about that with stuff like server. I mean, crazy, right? Customer service for ransomware, who'd have thought? Um, but these guys are mature, they're sophisticated, um, they're hard to catch, and they're getting paid at all of our expense, right? So something to think about. Um, and that's a theme I'd like to sort of weave through the talk about trends today. Oh, hey now. There we go. Uh, that's a theme I'd sort of like to weave through the talk today is sort of show how these guys are responding to business forces, um, how they're implementing uh, you know, new innovation and you know, return on investment uh, in different technologies. Um, it, it's really eye-boggling if you think about it, or mind-boggling rather. So the exchanges, let's start with basics, right? Uh, I think we're all vaguely aware that, hey, there are forums and exchanges all over the world, regionalized heavily, right? Um, you know, places like Russia, uh, definitely the, the leading exchange where they've got, you know, sort of down to a T, complementary goods and services in uh, an assembly line fashion, you know, modular, modularly creating, you know, and crafting crimeware campaigns to go hit our networks. Of, ourselves and our customers and our constituents. Uh, U.S., right, if you guys, uh, in U.S., it should be more North America, U.S. and Canada, right? Um, but uh, if you guys are in some of these same forums as me, I mean, I think you probably know that, you know, more than half the guys in there are probably FBI agents or, you know, some agents of some state. Um, so it's, it's sort of a really interesting mix uh, and lots of interesting conversation in some of these forums, right? Um, Brazil, China, Japan, Germany. Um, all regionally localized and specialized sort of outfits, right? Uh, specializing in different flavors of crimeware a lot of times. Uh, West Africa, uh, fraudster stuff is definitely on the rise in West Africa. Uh, there's some dispute as to who the real Nigerians are, quote unquote. Um, I mean, I think that they're equally as likely to be Romanian as they are Nigerian, um, but, uh, but that's neither here nor there, right? But what's happening on these exchanges is, you know, it's providing a marketplace for, I mean, key exchanges of goods and services. Um, you know, compromised creds for sale, um, traffic and delivery, you know, spam bots. Hey, I want to go deliver spam messages to, you know, a couple hundred thousand folks and deliver this payload. Um, hacking services, right? I need recon. Um, I need bug hunting. I need vulnerability development. Uh, malware dev, uh, ransomware services. You know, people want to pay for a new payload uh, to be specially crafted for them and their campaign that they're coming up with. Um, and infrastructure, right? Bots, uh, hosting, um, all sorts of things like this. And this is pretty routinely happening right under the noses of you know, all law enforcement folks. And honestly, there's not a whole lot that we can do about it uh, in this fashion because, I mean, these guys are really good at sniffing out, uh, you know, the, uh, the Fed, if you will. Does anyone remember back in the day at BlackCon, DEFCON, you know, spot the Fed? Yeah, oh, a couple people, thank God, man. Nowadays, it's spot the hacker because there aren't any hackers there. It's all security folks and Feds, right? Uh, role reversal. All right, so the services, the things that we're seeing out there routinely, uh, and this should be no surprise to some of you guys, it's kind of basic, right? Um, you know, as, as far as uh, traffic goes, compromised sites, 
right? Uh, malvertising, spam providers, uh, traffic distribution systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, delivery services, oops, sorry about that. Wrong button. Delivery services, exploit kits, drive-by download, droppers, clickbait, uh, and we'll talk a lot about some of these uh, and specifically moving forward here. Um, hacking services, you know, selling DDoS capabilities. Ask Brian Krebs about that, how that went for him, right? Um, credential harvesting, uh, and that's gonna be, credential harvesting is a huge theme that we've seen this year. Uh, and we'll talk specifically about some of the campaigns that have been leveraging that. Recon, bug hunting, all the things that are necessary evils to keeping the business machine rolling here, right? Uh, malware and payloads, think about these as your service, uh, I'm sorry, as your uh, product development teams, your R&D teams, right? You know, uh, we at RSA might be building a new net witness build, but these guys are building new ransomware builds, info stealers, you know, creating new miners, right? Stuff like that. Uh, rats for the more advanced campaigns, right? Dropping a back door on there so somebody can get in and have their way with your network, your data maybe. Talk to Equifax. Exploit development, huge, right? That's R&D, that's the new stuff coming up. Uh, and all the infrastructure, like we mentioned. Sh uh, shadow domains, bulletproof hosting, um, botnets, definitely botnets. So, how does it all work together, right? This is just a very simplistic diagram that, uh, that I came up with and my marketing people improved upon, quote unquote, I'll say. Um, but essentially, you know, traffic crosses infrastructure, uh, a delivery of an exploit is made, and then payloads or hacking happens, um, and then cash, money, new bots. Ooh, hey. Okay, seriously. It was Slavic. You guys got anything back there? Yep, nothing's happening. Stop. Good times. So there was this one time where, no, I don't have a story to, queued up for this, unfortunately. <laughs> this is totally part of the show, and I've prepared an interpretive dance number right now. So let's go ahead and get this show going here. No, this is totally not like Kevin has no talent because that will become apparent very quickly. Um, but you know, as we, as we figure this out, this issue here, I mean, it, it's really, really very important to sort of respect the competence uh, of these crimeware actors, right? I mean, these guys are making millions upon millions of dollars um, at our expense, um, and often in a pretty humiliating fashion for us, I mean, to be completely honest. Like, let's talk about Equifax for a second, right? Does anybody know what the, what the passwords were of the external web servers on Equifax that were hacked? The creds? Admin, admin. I kid you fucking not. Admin, admin, right? I mean, honestly, this is the credit bureau charged with protecting, safeguarding 100 plus million folks' security credentials, their, their financial information. Here we go, cool. Admin, admin, right? IT hygiene should be basics to us at this point, right? That's more than 50% of the problem space, and maybe more like 75% of it. If we don't have good IT hygiene um, in our networks, our customer networks, our constituents' networks, Everything we do is worthless, right? And that's something that you know you can't foot stomp enough. Uh, but you know how do you how do you you know how do you ensure good patch configuration practices uh, with a customer that you know is underwater in, in some other capacity, under fire from management by a, uh, you know for some other topic or subject matter, right? It's really hard to get through to some of these guys occasionally. Their priorities are not always our priorities uh, in cybersecurity, which is unfortunate, right? You would hope that they rely on us to provide the expertise there. But here we go, right? Working again. I'm not gonna touch that blank button, I swear. Um, how it works together, right? All these things sort of map to these pillars like we're talking about. But let's take a look at it from a criminal's point of view, right? Traffic comes in, right? Legitimate traffic herded into designated bottlenecks. And this could be, you know, this could be malvertising referrer strings, this could be a compromised site, this could be a TDS. Hits infrastructure crosses that botnet, right, or um, crosses that shadow domain or that landing page. Exploit gets delivered. These guys are watching. Oh, man, again. Exploit gets delivered. Um, 
as the exploit gets delivered, you know, it's typically customized, right? Uh, based on your user agent string in a lot of cases. I mean, this is not, you know, that 400 pound guy in the basement on his mom's couch, right? These are guys that know what they're doing. Um, as that exploit gets delivered, payloads happen. A rat gets dropped so they can hack against these guys. Bad stuff landing on that victim machine. What does that return to them? Sustainability, cash money, credentials, more bots for their botnets, et cetera, et cetera. It's a simplistic cycle. And forgive me for those of you that love the you know, kill chain. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it. I think something more simple uh, explains the problem space a little bit better occasionally, uh, especially when you're throwing abstract terms around like you know, how the ecosystem maps to it. Now, let's take a look at the, the customer side of this, or in this case, the victim side, my grandma, hypothetically, right? Grandma's email address, harvested or purchased maybe from a list server, a spam service, right? Grandma at hotmail.com. A friendly botnet delivers spam message to my grandma. Maybe targeted, maybe opportunistic, who knows. Ding, she's got mail. Oh, pictures of my grandkids. In this case, her great grandkids, right? Because I've got three and she sees them all the time and she can't get enough. She's licking their cheeks and stuff all the time, it's creepy. You know, grandma, oh, pictures. Click, what has grandma just done? I think you all know. Grandma suddenly has her machine locked up, and Kevin at 9.30 p.m. on a Saturday, hypothetically, gets a phone call. Kevin, my, my computer's not working. It's all locked up. I swear to God, hypothetically, right? So what does Kevin do? <laughs> Kevin blanks the screen. <laughs> well played, well played, screen gods. What does Kevin do? Kevin drives over to Grandma's retirement home, and... Pays the, pays the actors to unlock it, right? Wrong. Kevin just re-images their machine. We're not paying those bozos. So broke the cycle in this case. But you guys get the idea, right? There's two, two distinct vantage points um, in all these crime war campaigns. You know, the victim side and then the actor side. Just important to keep that in perspective, right? All right. Now, let's start talking about some trends and why are trends important, right? Uh, there's a lot of folks out there that would say, you know, trends, you know, normalized, normalized patterns, they don't really tell me that much about where these super advanced guys are going. Um, I would argue that the trends that we see in security data sets and flows and patterns of behavior from these actor groups directly provide indication to how these guys are going to be hitting a lot of our networks, our customer networks, and our constituents. It may not be 100% true for, you know, shell crew or for, you know, APT 28s. Uh, but for the bulk of the attacks that we're seeing on our networks and the bulk of the attacks that we can actually mitigate and defend against, trends are absolutely important. This case, Ultimate Anonymity Services, anybody familiar with them? You guys got to get in some of the same forums as me, man. These guys came on the, online about a month ago, um, peddling a couple hundred thousand RDP connections, right? Full creds, ready to go, right? Why is that important? Well, first off, Take a look at how business-like their opening email is. Before using our service, we strongly recommend that you familiarize yourself with our rules and pricing. I mean, this sounds like you're reading like the EULA from like, you know, a Verizon app or something on your phone, right? Um, so these guys, you know, come out, have this strong showing, strong sales pitch. We want to sell some RDP creds. Why does it matter, right? Why should I care about this? Well, A, these creds are worldwide. Um, and I want to give a shout out to, uh, to Vitaly from Flashpoint who let me steal, this, uh, steal a couple graphics from him. They did put out a report about two weeks ago on this. Definitely worth checking out and you got a reference on the bottom there. These creds are worldwide, right? Sometimes regionally, but you know, they're available almost everywhere depending where the flavor of the month is for your targets. If I look at the US, wow, these are really localized. So maybe understanding this trend, if I'm a guy operating out of Franklin County, Ohio, one of those big red heat map bubbles right there. Maybe I'm starting to think about like, hey, how's our RDP going? Are we locked down with RDP? Do we have default passes? Like, do we need RDP open on all these external facing servers? And then if I see this, the cost of an RDP cred for one of these IP addresses, it's under 10 bucks. Holy shit, I'm getting scared, right? Especially if I'm in one of those red circles. I'm thinking, man, RDP creds available right down the street from me for three bucks a machine? That's nuts, right? I mean, this gives you an idea of the availability of 
compromise credentials at a really, really inexpensive level. All right, so trend number one I want to really talk about, um, decline of exploit kits. Um, so last year, fall, winter, even early spring this year, exploit kits rained, right? Anybody else follow all the EI tests, pseudo dark leech campaigns, seamless campaigns, watched all those guys, I mean, essentially just, I mean, compromise site after compromise site after compromise site, just delivering a ton of nasty stuff, mostly ransomware. Uh, that was probably the biggest payload we saw from these guys. Some info stealers, but mostly ransomware. Well, we were lucky enough to team up with GoDaddy um, in the spring uh, and conduct a major takedown. We named it Shadowfall, right? A little bit cheesy, but you know, there was a marketing person in the room, so it had to happen. Um, right, and no offense to any marketing people, I love you guys for what you do. It's just we don't always connect at the right levels. You know, it's like Synac, huh, what? Anyways. Um, GoDaddy and ourselves managed to take down 40,000 plus actively resolving shadow domains um, in May of this year. So that's 40,000 resolved to an IP address, actually backended and hosted um, shadow domains, right? These shadow domains were primarily set up via programmatic access to the GoDaddy DNS API um, and in dramatic fashion, right? 500, 1,000, 1,500 at a time created, set up as landing pages for an exploit kit and then unplugged two days later as they got stale, right? And oftentimes, the, the customers that were compromised, none the wiser, had no idea, right? GoDaddy had no idea until we alerted them about this and we dug into it together. Identified probably five or six different patterns, different programmatic patterns for you know, how they accessed and set up these shadow domains and then had the naming conventions behind them. Well, when we unplugged them all, it was a pretty good feeling, right? 40,000 plus shadow domains unplugged one day to the next. Um, and I know it worked because a, we got some choice comments from some of the rig landing pages that were still functional, <laughs> which was always good. Uh, a little bit of respect, a lot of hatred, I would say, uh, as well. Um, a lot of money on the line there for these guys, right? Um, so we, we like to think that helped contribute a little bit to the decline of exploit kits, right? It's definitely not the only thing. Um, and I would recommend that folks that are interested in this, go take a look at uh, uh, Jerome Segura from Outware Bytes has a good report out from this summer, as well as Brad Duncan from Palo Alto's Unit 42 detailing all the reasons why we think exploit kits have declined over the summer, right? Um, and that's still the case right now. So what's the impact? The impact, malvertising, mal-spam, pick up as the main traffic and delivery vectors. 100% uh, the case. Um, who, who has worked mal-spam this summer? Has someone not worked mal-spam this summer? Oh, thank you, one person worked it? Oh shit, thank you, thank you, power, right? That's uh, a fun little graphic over there you can take a look at. That's just Twitter mentions, which honestly, I think is a very, very good source of intel. Uh, so if, you if you're not on Twitter and you work in security, you should get on Twitter. Uh, the bad guys are on there just as much as us. So what is this? Market forces at work? We took down a whole bunch of stuff. We took down a lot of their infrastructure and shadow domains, and suddenly, the amount of activity we're seeing mentioned on Twitter declines. Maybe coincidental, I don't think so. Neither do a bunch of other open source researchers. Well, that's one trend, right? So how did that work though? Let's map that back to that ecosystem we were talking about, right? Traffic comes in, malvertising, compromised sites, TDSs, the main flow of traffic exploit kits traditionally, right? Hits domain shadows or bulletproof hosting, that shady backend ASN everyone calls RTCOM. I shouldn't have said that probably, but you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And all the BGP peering agreements that go with RTCOM. Exploit kit lands a vulnerability, right? Or lands an exploit. And again, this is tailor-made stuff. This is custom stuff based on your user agent string in many cases. As they drop that, ram it ransomware. And this is you know, common to, to what we saw with RIG over uh, um, the late spring, definitely. Ram it ransomware, cryptocurrency miners, uh, chthonic banking trojan, all sorts of nasty stuff lands on the, that victim device. Cash money, credentials, right? Sustainability, that's what it's all about for these guys, right? They've got to keep that sustainability up and running. If they don't, they're dead in the water. So, after rig and exploit kits declined, we saw the summer of mouse spam, as we like to quote it, right? Um, and we're not alone in this. I mean, some real great intel and some real great inf information sharing from folks like James in the Box, um, Vitaly Kremez, uh, these are guys I work with pretty routinely on Twitter against mouse spam campaigns. If you don't follow them, I would. If you're interested and concerned about mouse spam, 
This little graphic over here is uh, from the month of September. Just all the campaigns that James saw with uh, the number of targets, the date time groups, um, how, what the delivery vehicle was, if it was a link or an attachment. Um, and, and there's a ton of information out there like this. Um, on the left side, you got links to all the different campaigns that we as RSA First Watch pushed reports on, uh, that we published on. Right? Um, and these are everything from the very most opportunistic give a fuck viral campaigns to more targeted verticals. Uh, banking Trojans, for instance, going against uh, a lot of Western industry banks and finance uh, sectors. And over to the right a little bit, more targeted stuff. Some of that stuff was direct APT, nation state activity, leveraging you know, very well crafted mouse man campaigns. My favorite up there is probably the Dimney campaign. Uh, where uh, APT28 and RU8 were going back and forth, uh, trading some choice words. Um, APT28 delivered a, a mouse spam uh, document with EPS exploit in it uh, to RU8. RU8 wrapped up the same document, the same EPS exploit, with some choice comments inside of it and sent it straight back to them. Um, there were some words like sluts Kaspersky in there, and I'm quoting that, I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, and also some choice lyrics by Slipknot from the song Snuff. If any of you know this song, uh, you'll realize that this was a very pointed message to these guys. Uh, so some real interesting back and forth here with, between APT nation state actors. As well as some of the, you know, the monsoons and the moon winds and some of the uh, more second tier nation state guys. So how does that look with our ecosystem, right? Let's take it back there, right? Mouse spam, one of the big things that we saw this summer was Locky. Oh my gosh, Locky was everywhere. I was so damn sick of Locky. Anyone else sick of Locky? Yes, yes. All right, so mouse spam, malvertising, right? Deliver traffic across botnets, bulletproof posting. Should be clickbait up there, not drive by download. It's my bad. Um, delivers ransomware, Locky, server, although server fell off a little bit this summer. Last fall, server was much, much more prevalent. I was just as sick as server last, last fall as I am of Locky this year. Infects my grandma's machine. Kevin! Cash money, creds. And the messed up thing here is, I mentioned that customer service aspect, right? Best practices from business being applied to, crim to crimeware campaigns. Server spent time and effort contracting a call center. I kid you not, a 1-800 number call center to walk people like my grandma through the payment process to decrypt their machine. And you know what's even better? They got like five star ranking, ratings. Like everyone loved them, everyone loved them. I, say, I kid you not, they're probably Yelp reviews, go look. Just crazy, right? I mean, it's the small things that make a difference, right? If you can invest in customer service, I don't care what business you are, legit or, or illegitimate, right? and increase your revenue income by 10, 15%, why the hell not? And that's what they've done. Ransomware remains a reliable revenue stream, right? And that's something that we need to think about, right? These guys are smart enough to incrementalize and diversify their revenue streams. That is a lesson straight out of the playbook of any business that's successful, right? Ransomware is money they know they can count on, um, and they're counting on it. So, just a note here, and I got some little blue notes just to swat people in the back of the head occasionally. If you're being targeted by ransomware, if mouse spam is a problem, there's some very logical things you can do. Employ DMARC people. Uh, domain message authentication and reporting controls, I think. Open source project, right? It's basically a way of understanding and establishing reputation in domains so that you're not accepting mail from shady domains. Another very basic thing. If a domain is brand new, if it's 24, 48 hours old, please don't take email from them. No legitimate business is going to start blasting email to you within 48 hours of standing up a new domain. It's just not going to happen. If it does, you can blame me. All right, another trend. Bulletproof hosting, right? So the destabilization of Ukraine is a great example of this, right? You know, 2014, 2015, pro-Russian separatists, you know, decided that they wanted to rise up in Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. There weren't any helicopters dropping them. There were no trucks or artillery pieces rolling in. Just, you know, hypothetically, these guys just decided to rise up, right? Well, regardless of how that happened, the, the net effect has been a destabilizing factor within Eastern Ukraine, right? Anytime a region is destabilized, you know, law and order goes to hell in a handbasket, right? And so anyone that's worked mouse spam this summer, anyone that's worked ransomware this summer, or the last, last year and a half, actually, 
um, has probably seen a lot of domain registration stuff straight to Donetsk, Ukraine, Luhansk, Ukraine, all sorts of spots right here in our friendly trouble area where pro-Russian separatists are clashing with Ukrainian authorities, right? And it's really pretty brilliant if you think about it. Um, you know, law and order goes to hell in a handbasket. You have an opportunity of, I'm a citizen in you know, east, southeast Ukraine here, I need to make a buck or two. Hey, maybe I should just spin up some VPSs and host a whole bunch of crimeware. I mean, who's gonna come knocking? Like Interpol, Europol? Hell no, they're not going into this war zone, right? So if you need to make some money, it's a good idea. A little bit shadier and more devious idea though, and a hypothesis of mine, is that you know, nothing much happens under Vladimir Putin's nose. Um, especially in a place where his troops and his SVR, FSB guys are deployed, um, wouldn't it be a great idea to destabilize a region and help pay for your campaign by hosting crimeware services and bulletproof hosting there and taking a cut of the crimeware revenue stream? Seems pretty good, right? Seems like a pretty good idea. I think I'm gonna try that in Denver, see how it goes. Probably not very well. Yeah, so hey, they're not enforcing many laws. Let's host some crimeware here. Great idea, everybody. It's happening. And the interesting thing is, as we can see continued destabilization in other regions, look for Moldova next. I wouldn't be surprised if we see the same trend happening. Bulletproof hosting providers popping up there. Backends for ransomware, backends for crimeware campaigns. All right, another big trend. And this should be a no-brainer for a lot of you guys, I hope. Uh, credential and infrastructure harvesting has been huge this year. The last six months, it's been off the charts, right? Um, this aspect, it's a nice little graph here. Um, just of September, brute force SSH attacks. No surprise, another uh, key offender, oops, key offender, uh, Chinese ASNs, uh, all littered throughout the top, uh, top offenders here. Um, but honestly, it makes you wonder if there was a shortage of compromised credentials to host things like exploit kit landing pages, shadow domains, et cetera, what would your next step be? Probably to continue ramp up your exploitation initi initiatives to harvest infrastructure, harvest credentials, right? Scarcity of goods implies that we should go after those because the price is right. And that's what's happening here. Um, and this has been a trend that's been on the upward arc for years now, right? Uh, anyone that's in network defense you know, consistently sees scanning, consistently sees fuzzing, consistently sees brute force attempts, RDP ports and SSH ports. But the really scary thing here is that in my experience, most guys on the network defense size have become desensitized to this. They just don't care anymore, right? Oh, it's just scanning, leave it alone, man. Oh, it's just some brute force stuff, leave it alone, we're good. We got two factor, we're all right, man, no big deal. Right, and honestly, these are indications of attacks potentially. Yes, much of it is just opportunistic scanning, looking for default creds or a port open with password one, two, three, four, right, stuff like that. Uh, but in many cases, this is your first indication that somebody's coming after you, right? So we have to figure out a way to understand the importance and the significance of scanning brute force attacks in our networks. Indicative of increased demand for scarce goods? I don't know. You guys be the judge. And honestly, people, why the fuck is port 22 open? Seriously? 3389, why is that open? Like, I, I, one of our lab guys the other day, and I'm not gonna mention his name because it's embarrassing, um, you know, set up a new VPN for us, right? And on the VPN client machine, he had port 22 open externally. Like within three days, we saw like this huge spike in traffic come into our box. And luckily we caught it in time, but just a very simple misconfiguration. It shows you that anyone is susceptible to this. So we always have to be vigilant watching for the basics. This is basic IT hygiene. If you don't need SSH open externally, don't open it externally, please. All right, credential harvesting back there, right? And remember, mouse spams are a big delivery vector, right? Big traffic vector. TrickBot Enhancer. I am so tired of TrickBot Enhancer. This summer, TrickBot has been the, the banking Trojan flavor of, of the entire summer. Um, and TrickBot is actually pretty elegant malware if you take a look at it. I mean, it uses process injection and um, has a bunch of encrypted content that goes with it. It's, it's pretty cool as far as malware goes. I didn't do anything, right? All right. Whew. But TrickBot, you know, is something that it, it's 
it's looking for creds, right? It's looking for, to steal information from, your, from its victims. Um, in many cases, banking creds, but it, it's not picky. It's gonna take whatever it can get. And there are a lot of different file extensions it goes after, Bitcoin wallets, for instance, right? Um, you know, speaking of that, well, I got a funny story, but I'll mention it a little bit later. We're gonna talk about cryptocurrency. Hmm. No, no dice? No? Shit. <laughs> All right, so delivery vector, right? TrickBot, Hanseter, classic info stealers. Um, you know, and Banking Trojans, it hasn't been just TrickBot. It's been Retief. Um, it's been uh, Drydex, a little bit of resurgence in Drydex again recently. Um, it's been Corbot is back. Anyone remembers Corbot? Um, these are all things that actors are dusting off, updating, and going after creds, right, in a heavy and fast way, which makes me think they need creds, right? Uh, maybe it's partly due to some of the, the rig exploit kit takedown. Maybe it's partly due to you know, them just exhausting their supply, and this is the natural cycle of things. In any case, it's indicative of demand in their marketplaces, right? All right, thank you. I'm gonna buy you guys a beer later and roofie it. <laughs> Sorry, I was joking, totally joking. <laughs> All right, mouse spam delivers, delivers via botnets and bulletproof hosting. RTCOM, remember those guys? Ah, oh, jeez. Cesspool. Worse than OVH, honestly. Clickbait, we click on it. Suddenly, TrickBot Banking Trojan, Hanseter Info Stealer, grabbing all your creds, breaking your machine. Well, not really breaking it in this case, but you get the idea. Credentials, that's what they're after. That's the number one seller right now today, credentials. Hey, thanks for the bank account info, dude. I love it, man. What can you do about this, right? There's some very basic, obvious things. For instance, oh, yeah, yeah, that thing again. For instance, weird. I'm downloading a PNG file, and it's really an executable. I mean, honestly, folks, if you're downloading something, and it's not an EXE extension type, and it ends up being executable, you should immediately be looking at this, right? I, ho I hope we all are on the same page there. All right, so what's happening with all these creds? What are they doing with all this stuff, right? Um, I mean, are they just you know, spinning, up, uh, spinning up video games on them and uh, doing craziness? Not really. Bots, one of the biggest things we're seeing, right? And this is not new. I mean, we all should be aware of botnets and you know, understand the threat that botnets pose. Necker is number one, long-term botnet. Lots of different device types, personal computers, PCs, other devices, et cetera responsible for tons of mouse spam campaigns. Locky, TrickBot, et cetera, uh, for, for years now. That thing has been lurking in the, in the backdrop and just you know, delivering campaigns at will, essentially. Um, what's a little scarier are some of the IoT botnets, right? The Mirai and PureSI botnets from last summer, you know, taking advantage of default credentials on IoT devices, um, building into millions of numbers of bots. And these guys largely believed to be responsible for the dine outage on the East Coast last summer as a, sh a show of power, show of force, uh, just to prove, hey, we, we can leverage this and weaponize this botnet. Uh, they did, right? Twitter was down. I was like, oh, God, Twitter, no. Twitter's down. Reaper. Reaper's a newer one, right? Uh, I like to think of this as a little bit more sophisticated uh, sort of botnet than, than Mirai, only in the fact that because they're leveraging actual vulnerabilities. They're, they're leveraging exploit DB, public vulnerabilities to roll through Linksys, Netgear, D-Link, IP cameras, et cetera, et cetera, and attack them, right? With, with stock, easy one-line vulnerabilities to grab credentials, grab passwords, get command line access into these devices, right? I know this because we've seen their attacks in our infrastructure. We've seen them in our sinkhole infrastructure. Uh, we published a good article about a week and a half, two weeks ago, that rolls through the CVs and shows you the request and response headers for these various attacks. Check it out. What's scary about these guys is we don't know who owns them. I don't know who's in control of these guys. If somebody does, please grab me afterwards. I'd love to get some details on that. But what's really frightening is what are their purposes? What are their intentions? What are their motivations, right? Is it about cash money? Uh, is it about making a political statement? What happens when these botnets get turned against critical infrastructure, right? It's a scary thought, honestly. How are they being weaponized, right? And I mean, we talked about mouse spam, malvertising, hacking services. These are all more traditional things. Operational relay botnets, right? If bad actors, nation state guys are controlling some of these botnets, they're damn sure using them to obfuscate their activities, right? And operational relay botnets are a real thing and 
if IoT Reaper is being used for that, none of us might be the wiser that our camera is being used to you know, attack D&D networks, for instance, right? And if we were able to figure that out, if D&D was able to figure that out, and I'm pointing at you, John, if they were able to figure that out, then they would lead back to my, my IP camera, and that's it. The trail goes cold after there, right? So very, very dangerous capabilities in the wrong hands. The DDoS thread, right? And this is no joke. I mentioned Dyn, right? DDoS thread. This is, uh, these are some graphs from an Arbor Networks report uh, based on 2013 through 2016 DDoS stats, I think. If you look in the top left there, you'll see the, the number one target, of course, is the US because, I don't know, because we're douchebags for the most part, um, because of our president, probably, for the second part. Um, the fifth target's Canada, though, right? So you guys should be concerned about that. And what's even more disconcerting is look to the right there. If you look to the right there, yes, yes. Whew. To the right there, right? Look at 2013, 2014, 2015, right? Relatively modest bar charts, right? Maybe this doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you can't see it all the way. Uh, the green, ah, the green is over 100 gigabits per second attacks, DDoS attacks. The red is over 200 gigabit per second attacks. Those attacks in particular have more than quadrupled from 2015 to 2016. That means somebody's able to pour 200 gigabits per second of traffic onto a single IP address or a series of IP addresses. And that's the scary thing. Oh, man. That's the scary thing, right? Is it is impossible to separate you know, an actual DDoS threat from DDoS extortion. This email right here on the bottom is you know, one that we saw on our networks for Phantom Squad. Ooh, scary. Phantom Squad's sort of like a you know, cheesy knockoff on Liz Anyone from Phantom Squad in here? All right, cool, I'm going to say this. This cheesy knockoff of Lizard Squad, right? A bunch of gamers that, you know, took down, hypothetically, supposedly, purportedly took down, you know, some, some gaming networks, PlayStation networks for a while. But honestly, those networks are really not that hard to take down. Um, but they're being leveraged and their name is being leveraged as street cred to make people pay these, pay this extortion note. We are Phantom Squad. You better pay us X amount of Bitcoin, otherwise we're going to DDoS you on this day. And people pay. I don't blame them, right? I mean, if you're a CISO in this position and you believe this is a credible threat and you think that, shit, this is not a time that our network can afford to be taken down. Uh, I'm a healthcare company and I have open enrollment going on right now. There's no way that I can afford this to happen. I'm going to pay the Bitcoin. It's an insurance policy, right? Even if it's a you know, couple thousand bucks, a hundred thousand bucks, I'm paying it. Sad. Even scarier. You know, I'm a student of electronic warfare. Anyone else? Yes, the one guy. Oh, you just fake rose your hand? That was, that was sucky. <laughs> All right, thanks, man. Yeah. So electronic warfare, right? When you're putting RF jamming on a target, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can pour all your RF onto one frequency, continuous wave style, and just blast that RF, and nobody's communicating on that frequency. Or you can sweep, you can pulse, you can barrage, you can expand your target range of, R of radio frequencies and adequately jam them still. Well, threat actors have determined, hey, I don't need to put all my DDoS power on one IP address consistently. I can pulse across numerous targets, which expands their target surface, right? So suddenly that, you know, the handful of IP addresses that were being DDoSed can turn into a whole IP range for your entire network, right? Uh, that's pretty good technological innovation. What do you do? DDoS protection is, you know, a no-brainer. But fallback comms plans. If you're on the defense side, you have to have a fallback comms plan. Right? I don't care if you're a small business, medium business, or a large business. You got to have that. That's just emergency action plan type stuff. Oh. I don't even know what the next slide is. Yes. The rise of the miners. Right? I always equate this with like, you know, some sort of a like, you know, Terminator or backdrop with like, machines coming out of skulls and stuff. But, uh, so Bitcoin, right? <laughs> blockchain is not a new idea, right? Blockchain has been around for a while, and the idea of decentralized digital currency has been around for a while. Bitcoin was the first real company to implement it in 2009, I think. Yeah, 2009. Um, but what we didn't realize is that you know, would-be innovators on the crime war actor side would weaponize cryptocurrency mining and start delivering mining payloads as secondary, even primary payloads for their campaigns. Why? It's a reliable revenue stream. Think about ransomware, right? If they know that they can get a couple bucks out of every infection more uh, for, for dropping mining software, why not? Why not do it? 
even more disturbing than that is drive-by mining. Anyone uh, read the articles about Showtime recently? Yes, one guy, oh man, I gotta get with you. Uh, Showtime, right? Drive-by mining is essentially weaponized JavaScript on a web page so that when I browse it, or my grandma browses it, or whoever browses it, to you know, stream videos, uh, watch Donnie Darko, whatever I'm doing, um, in the background, that JavaScript is also gonna be actively mining cryptocurrency while I'm streaming video. Brilliant concept, right? Nobody's any the wiser. I mean, if your performance is slow, your bandwidth is slow when you're streaming video, I mean, I think that's an expectation in a lot of cases, right? Oh, I'm buffering again, unless you're Paul and you went through your VPN and you're screwing everyone on your United flight. Yeah, Paul, I know what's up. Right, but there's a lot of questions about this. There's a lot of debate about this, right? Because cryptocurrency is no legal. Mining cryptocurrency is no legal. You know, even drive-by mining of cryptocurrency in browser isn't illegal. CoinHive API is out there, right? It's a legitimate company pushing a capability to allow web developers to mine cryptocurrency in the browser space instead of instead of floating ads, right? Who wants more ads? No one. Right? So if you're able to legitimately throttle and you know, inform customer traffic to your website to say, hey, instead of ads, we're doing this thing called you know, cryptocurrency mining in the browser. We're throttling it to a modest rate so as not to impact performance on your machine, but you have a choice. Would you like ads or would you like the cryptocurrency mining? And both of them will completely exit out as normal whenever you close your web page and browser. No lasting impact to you or your machine. That seems like a reasonable offering, right? Malware actors, though, have decided, let's take advantage of this and let's completely peg your processor at 100% and pretty much melt your machine while you're watching Showtime videos, right? That's called crypto jacking, right? Jerome Segura, a fellow Canadian, guy in Vancouver, Malwarebytes, just published a good article by this uh, just last week. Uh, he and I were talking about it. So check that out if you're interested. Definitely something cutting edge. And to boot, it's so simple. This is, this is it. This is cryptocurrency mining. This is Monero mining uh, from a malicious payload, a minor payload that landed on a client machine. It's just JSON. Very distinctive looking, but go look up Stratum, or, or Strata, Stratum, Stratum, excuse me, um, is the most common protocol, but everybody is just using clear JSON um, to, to represent mining traffic. It's very distinctive, very easy to see, so remember that. You see that in your network and it's not supposed to be there, you should probably find out who's doing it, right? Fire that guy. How it's being delivered, back to that ecosystem. Malvertising, TDSs, pushing against domain shadows and bulletproof hosting. Terror Exploit Kit has been delivering miners most of the summer. Uh, not, not heavily active, uh, but it's there, it's present. Dropping ransomware and coin miners, right? Diversification of revenue streams. To crack up my grandma's machine again, leave my grandma alone. Cash money, right? Diversification of revenue streams. That is a very sophisticated business, business model, right? These guys, these guys know what they're doing, right? Let's see here. So, I mean, in a funny story, right? So, oh, here we go. New revenue stream, yes, right. So, I had a buddy um, who in 2011, I think, bought, uh, bought 2,000 bucks worth of Bitcoin, right? For just under 500 Bitcoin. You guys have any idea how much money that's worth today? About three and a half million dollars. The Bitcoin exchange he was hosting it on got hacked and it got taken from him. Consequently, he's still working for RSA, which kind of sucks, right? But <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for the guy, his name's Mike. What can you do about this? Domain reputation services and threat intel, right? Threat intel is underrated in a lot of cases for stuff like this, right? Let your threat intelligence guys go to town on this. If they can't tell you that this is a mining service happening, um, then they're probably not worth what they're getting paid. The last trend we'll talk about, uh, the prevalence of SSL and code signing certs. Um, does anyone remember back in the early days where everyone thought, oh, it's encrypted, oh, it's assigned executable, it's safe, it's good, we know that's good, right? That, that was like the common representation of encrypted traffic and of signed executables in particular, right? Uh, that has changed dramatically, right? Maybe a few years back, nation state advanced actor campaigns decided we're gonna start encrypting all of our traffic, right? We're gonna steal an SSL cert from somebody or borrow an SSL cert from somebody. We're gonna get in a supply chain and compromise a code signing cert for a company, maybe a self-signed one so we can sign our executable, right? 
Well, that has trickled down to a lot more crime war actors now. We're seeing on a consistent basis crime war, commodity crime war actors using encrypted communications, encrypted C2, right? Uh, TrickBot, Retief, CCleaner. Uh, these are all big viral opportunistic campaigns that use encrypted C2 comms, all right? Self-signed certs, we're seeing that on the rise dramatically as well. Um, and that's especially disturbing when you think about what might be in your root cert store, right? When's the last time you guys all looked at your, you know, on your Microsoft box in the root certificate store? Anyone? Anyone recently? Anyone in the last year looked in their root certificate store? One, two, three, four, okay, a handful of people. All right, what's really disturbing is that we don't know what's in our root most fundamentally trusted certificate store for our machines. This is the ability to decrypt your SSL communications. This is the ability to completely root your device, your machine, right? A great example of how actors are taking advantage of this in a supply chain attack fashion is Savvy Tech Audio. Savvy Tech is a Taiwanese company, chip manufacturer and high def uh, you know, computer audio uh, manufacturer, right? Savvy Tech and all of their infinite wisdom decided we want to support Windows XP through Windows 2010. Well, Windows XP didn't have to go through the WHQL process as far as certificate validation and approval process with Microsoft. So to support Windows XP, Savvy Tech created a self-signed cert. Said, hey, all right, we'll use the self-signed cert to cover here. And actually, it's a common practice among a lot of vendors. But what isn't a common practice is Savvy decided we're going to bundle all of our drivers together. So XP through Windows 2010 are in one bundle, and all the certs are in one bundle. So if I buy a new Savvy Tech appliance, plug it in, install the USB drivers, and I'm on Windows 10, that Windows XP cert gets inserted into my root store whether I'm on XP or not. That is a concern, right? I mean, honestly, that is such a poor and, and irresponsible practice by those guys. Any of those thousands of devices running savvy, savvy audio tech device drivers suddenly have introduced a massive vulnerability to their customer base, right? And if that root cert, if that cert, the private key gets compromised, uh, that Taiwanese cert gets compromised, then all of those devices immediately susceptible to being rooted in SSL decryption. That's huge. That is freaking huge, right? And they're not the only one. There are a handful of these that we're aware of. And if these are just the ones that we're aware of, there are obviously dozens more practices like this in the industry. Scary, scary stuff. What can you do? Certificate whitelisting, blacklisting, number one. Obvious stuff. Know who you trust in your networks. Care about SSL cert metadata. And this is one you can take advantage of right now. Crime war actors that are using this stuff are really sloppy in their implementation. They're not even populating issuer or organization. Or if they are, it's like a DGA blurb or something that makes no sense, right? Or Microsoft is one that I saw with a U instead of an O. And I'm like, seriously, Microsoft? Like, this looks legit to you guys? But this is not a hard problem for them to, to react to, right? If they clean this up and clean it up effectively, it's going to be increasingly more difficult to tell the difference between viable SSL certs and shady ones. And then finally, know what's in your root store. Please take a look at your home machines. Just do it just one time. If you're drinking, whatever, I don't care. Take a look for five seconds. And if, the, if you know what's in there, everything that's in there, uh, call me and I will send you like a bottle of liquor, all right? <laughs> I guarantee you, all of us have something in there that we forgot about or are not aware of. Scary. All right, so recap. Trends. One, malvertising mouse spam. Those are the big players right now. Uh, those are the ones delivering traffic, taking advantage of traffic to deliver badness. Two, darknet's not going away. Those guys are focused on credential harvesting. They're more active than ever and better funded than ever. Three, ransomware, cryptocurrency mining, reliable revenue streams for these guys. And anytime you have a reliable revenue stream, it allows you to plan for the future. Four, botnet capabilities, scary, scary stuff. You think about what these botnets are gonna be doing when there are you know, two million autonomous cars on the road in the year 2025, right? If I'm on a, if I'm on a family trip, with my kids in the middle of the highway, my kids, in the middle of the highway, and somebody locks down my autonomous car, I'm paying a couple Bitcoin, guaranteed. Guaranteed. And finally, increased adoption of encryption is gonna make all of our lives more miserable. It's gonna make it harder for us to defend our networks, understand good from bad, and to really effectively do our jobs as cybersecurity folks.
and it's going to blank out right now probably, right? That is the conclusion.